Hey everyone, welcome to this video on creating the procedural granite texture. Now this is pretty much going to be an overview of the texture itself as well as a walkthrough of some of the techniques and tools that I use to actually create this material. If you don't already know, on Facebook there is this Blender Procedural Textures group. It's a closed group so if you want to join that if you're not already a member ask for permission and I'm sure you'll be added. And it's a great page that has all these challenges every couple of weeks to create all these different materials and it can really push your blender skills and your procedural texture making skills to the limit to really get some good results. So you can see a few of the other members of the group entering their, their final versions for the granite material. Luckily this fortnight I actually won that competition and what I thought I would do is actually just take you through this material. So before I go any further, there's a couple of things I just want to explain, just so we're all on the same page. Now the first thing is there is a really useful tool called the Blender Material Preview Scene. So if you don't already have that, if you just type in Blender, in fact you don't even have to type in Blender, Blender Material Preview Scene, bmps.blend, you just type this into your search bar, it's actually just the first result that comes up, you can click on that and it will automatically download you the blend file, then you can just click on that and open it up. So this is a pretty simple scene, it's essentially just this shader ball in this environment so you can get some interesting reflections, there's some lighting set up, there's a camera set up, you'll probably have to change the device over to GPU, but things like the sampling and everything like that set up pretty well to give you a decent render on your materials. You can see that we have over here we have some uh, surface details set up for the background as well and that gives you a really nice render. If you don't already know, hitting zero on the number pad jumps straight to your camera view so you can always render out your previews. Um, there's a little bit of information here about the Creative Commons license for this scene so I definitely recommend downloading this scene. I'm just going to close this down just now have another version of that, I'll close that as well. So this is where I usually create my scenes. So this is the actual file that I uploaded to the group. You can see that I actually built my whole system into a node group. I can tab into this and you can see it's a pretty complex node tree and I'll go through that in a little bit more detail later on. For the moment I just want to take you through a couple of other things. The first thing is the Node Wrangler. This is an add-on that you can get for Blender. I don't think it's one you actually have to download. I believe it's one that's already included in Blender. You just have to go all the way down to the bottom. And uh, it's in there somewhere you just enable it. In fact, let's see it's under Node, Node Wrangler. You can just enable that and as usual you can click on documentation and check out some of the information about it. I find it extremely useful. It lets you easily add frames and add node setups and things like that. So for example, if you're using texture nodes, which I use quite a lot, especially in these procedural challenges, you can add in a noise texture and use Control T to automatically add in some mapping and texture coordinate nodes. Things like Shift A and Shift S let you add in nodes. You can also do a few other really interesting things. For example, if you've got a couple of texture nodes, you can hold ALT and right click and drag between a couple of nodes and automatically add in an RGB mix node. That can be incredibly useful as well. There's a few other um, really useful things that the Node Wrangler can do. One of them is holding CTRL and SHIFT and right, uh, left clicking on a node and you'll actually see the unlit version of whatever has been piped out. That can be incredibly useful as well. One drawback for that is if you're in one of these node groups and you tab into it, if you want to look at any of these individual nodes and see the result, you can actually use that technique of using Control Shift and clicking on a node to see that result. You have to actually ungroup the entire node to do that. So I'm going to tab out this and um, let's just have a quick look through this node itself. So the node group 
has quite a few different controls. I essentially grabbed as many different attributes from the, the node tree as I could. So I had a lot of control to make a lot of different types of material. I wasn't entirely sure how much control I would be able to get just using this technique. I have a master scale which pretty much scales up material pretty well. Depending on the kind of scale of your scene, you may not have to change that too much. So at the moment I've got this set just between 0 and 3 just as a default. You can always go into any of these nodes and change these defaults pretty easy. We have the cloud scale. The cloud scale is essentially the pink cloudiness that's happening here. It scales up and down. The same with all these other scales. Just all individual sizes of different noise textures. Things like the grey mask randomness, this changes how the grey mask works. You can change this to have quite large shapes, quite small shapes, quite fine shapes. Again, there's some more ones for scale and things like that. The hue is quite interesting, it lets you change background colour. And the kind of pinky colour that I used in the reference through greens, blues, pinks, purples and everything. You can also desaturate that if you want. Uh, there's also the value of it, so you can make it darker or lighter. You can see just with a few adjustments, you can actually start to come in, create something that's a little bit different. Again, we've got some more brightness and contrast values there, and I have this reflectivity adjusted as well. So, for example, if I take this and pull this all the way down, I get a more diffuse texture. And with this up just a little bit, I get some nice specks on some of the, the different areas of this texture, and they'll just bring up some nice little speckly highlights to really sell this. I also have this height output here as well as this roughness output. Now the roughness output, that can be easily adjusted. If you look at that you can see that we have all these little black specks for the shinier parts. And some cloudy shapes as well just to give it not quite so uniform diffuse roughness. I have this height one here. Now you can plug this into a vector normal map, uh, sorry, a vector bump, plug the height into the height and then into the normal and then when you look at that, see that we'll actually get a little bit of variety in height. If I just increase the reflectivity back up, you can actually see that we have a little bit of an adjustment in height. Obviously you can go in, you can change the distance and increase or decrease the strength. You can also plug in another normal map if you have one. One other thing you can do is you can always go in and grab this height, plug it straight into the diffuse. Just turn this off. Now if you don't already know this technique, if you change the feature set over to experimental and on the sphere itself, I'm just going to make sure that I have subsurface and to adaptive. I don't think I need to change anything else there. Just bump it up a couple of levels just in case. Go to the material setup and under displacement I'll change this to true or both. In case we'll go with both and click on this again. Should be able to do is go back to solid and then go back to rendered. Should slightly displace the surface of this now. Bump map itself is pretty subtle, so it's not really displacing it too much. You can see on the shadow there that there is a bit of displacement placement but it is pretty subtle. You can always pull in something like a uh, brightness contrast. Just bump up the contrast of these nodes a little bit. You do always have to go in back to solid and then back to rendered to get the displacement to work again. You can see breaking up the outline of that sphere a lot more this time. You can actually see it around the logo as well. Breaking it up quite a bit. For that one I would probably have Roughness down a fair bit. Maybe have this just down to maybe 0 0.1, 0 0.2, something like that, just to give a very slight highlight to some of these little minerals poking through. 
that's just a way that you can take this node itself and make some adjustments and pipe in some displacement, pipe in some normal map, anything like that and get a nice little result. So I'm going to leave that there for this particular video. In the next video I'm going to go into a little bit more detail on this node itself. I'm going to open it up and show you the way I basically laid out and created this node. And then after that I'll take you through a few general tips and tricks that I think pretty much anyone that's creating procedural textures specifically in Blender should know.